Happy Tuesday, sophomores. I am going to look at our reading for today. Uh, like I told you guys, I'm going to do one per day for you guys. It actually is Tuesday. I realize I'm wearing the same shirt I was on Monday. Um, uh, but uh, I did actually wait to make this video because I, I wanted to be like you and let some of this stuff process uh, that I said yesterday. And uh, that's a neat thing happened yesterday. I got a couple of emails from students who wrote some very nice things to me, which I had asked you guys to do at the end of uh, last video. Now, I didn't say specifically write to me, but uh, I did appreciate the ones that did. Um, it meant a lot, and um, it really kind of, you know, helped me refocus uh, because, you know, this isn't easy for me. I know, I know it feels like I'm just throwing down some questions, and then I sit in front of a video, hit play, and go, but um, I'll refilm these six or seven times sometimes to make sure they're right, and I mean, they still aren't right. It's just the best they can be. Um, and I still agonize over it, and I'll spend all this time going over your questions, and you know I'll go back and look at my numbers on the videos and realize that no one's watching them, and I put all that effort into them, and you get frustrated, they get sad. Well, I had a couple of students email me yesterday. Um, I'd say who they are, but I didn't get their permission. I don't want to embarrass them, but they know who they are. And it really uh, made me feel a lot better, and uh, reminded me that you know maybe this isn't for. I don't do I don't do all that work for the entire class. Although I mean I, I want the entire class to benefit. If one or two kids really get something out of it, then my job is complete and I've done what I was supposed to. It's not about numbers. Um, it, it never has been and it never should be. So we're going to look today at the next couple of introductory sections in this book that are going to get us to the actual meat of the book starts when we start seeing the numbered Tuesdays. Let's say the first Tuesday, the second Tuesday, the third Tuesday. And he'll follow that up with we talk about blank and then the whole chapter kind of revolves around that topic, which I think is a brilliant design uh, choice on Mitch Album's part. Um, I think that's one of the highlights of this book, to be honest with you, is that it is so accessible because of the way he arranges it. And these first few sections do that too. So early on, we had, had, we had the curriculum, we had the syllabus. Today, we're going to get particularly the student in the classroom. And there's a, one called the audiovisual that's going to that's gonna be like a little uh, interim that we're going to see multiple times in here, and I'll explain it when we get to it. But the first one's called the student. And in this section, um, Alma is discussing a little bit about himself and his past, all right? And, you know, I grew up, and I wouldn't even grew up. I, I mean, I, I did grow up with it, but I was older. I was in my 20s and probably even a little bit of my 30s uh, watching something on Sundays on ESPN called The Sports Reporters. And Mitch Album was a constant fixture on there. He was a uh, sports writer, and he was a well-thought-of and well-known sports writer. Now, I don't know about the time frame about when this book came out and when that was going on, but I know he was a sports writer before. The guy was all business, uh, very professional, uh, and a brilliant man. Okay, So the, this part of the chapter, that first and the student, kind of gives us the breakdown of how he became that way. And guys, it's kind of a sad story, to be honest with you. Um, let me read you some passages from it that I found to be particularly important, and then we're going to actually talk about uh, your, the thing I wanted you to think about today, because it comes out of this chapter, actually. All right, um, so Album graduates and feels like he's going to, you know, come out, like a lot of, you know, driven college graduates, you're going to come out, you're going to change the world, you're going to do all these amazing things, and then you realize really quickly, and this isn't meant to discourage you guys, this should never discourage anyone, okay? You know, you try anyway, it doesn't matter what the world is about, you be you and what person God designed you to be, but he realizes really quickly when he gets out there that the world's just, he, in fact, this is the word he says, he says, the world I discovered was not that interested, and he's talking about in him. You know, the world's got its own stuff going on, and your dreams and your desires just, you know, aren't on the menu, and uh, a lot of the times that's really intimidating for people as they walk, they go from a really, you know, insulated world like a lot of you are living in right now, especially, a, you know, a small high school, you know, uh, and then you go out into this huge, you know, some of you are going to go to a equally fairly small college one day um, or you're going to where, wherever you go to college, you're still going to insulate yourself in this small bubble. But then eventually when you get out of the big world, you, you realize really quickly that it's it's not nice. It just isn't. Sad to say. I wish it was, but it's not. Um, so Mitch Album's talking about spending some time with, I believe it's an uncle he had that he loved. And his uncle is dying from, uh, I believe it's stomach cancer, but something that's causing him some issues with his stomach. And um, 
you know, there's this, this moment where this man looks at him and says, look, when I die, will you take care of my kids? And album basically kind of changes the subject. Okay. He says, Oh, don't talk that way. You know, the kind of things you want to say when you don't really want to think about that. It, it actually really disappoints this uncle who kind of, you know, looks at him sadly, which indicates, you know, he needed that peace of mind. You know, it's okay for me to go. And he robs him of that because, you know, why? Well, because, you know, he's worried about his own things right then. All right. It says he died a few weeks later talking about that uncle. Then it says, after the funeral, my life changed. I felt as if time were suddenly precious, water going down an open drain, and I could not move quickly enough. So album handles death, death of a loved one, the way a lot of men, especially my age have and, and older, have handled death for the longest time. We don't really acknowledge it. We just throw ourselves into being busy. Uh, you know, if you're too busy to think about it, you won't be sad and you don't have to acknowledge it. So album decides, Hey, you know, one day I'm going to die too. I want to get everything I can now while I'm still here. So he throws himself in his job. He works every single day of his life, almost the entire day to show you how bad it is. Uh, he gets married at one point. Let, let me read this passage. He says, I met a dark haired woman named Janine who somehow loved me despite my schedule and the constant absences. We married after a seven year courtship. Now think about that. Seven years he dates this girl. I was back to work a week after the wedding. Think a week later, he's right back at work. Now, some of us don't have a choice. You know, uh, when Mitzi and I got married, we were out. We were on our honeymoon. We were out for about a week. And then I came back and got to work when it was school time and she had to get back to work too. But the fact is, is that he wants to stress that. And, and you know, obviously a lot of people can't take off like a month after their marriage. I mean, that's ridiculous, but he's like focusing on, I did that. Now it's back to the grind. And now this woman's there too, but really my life is not different because my life is not about her. My life is about the job. And that's the problem. He says, I told her and myself that we would one day start a family, something we wanted very much, but we, it never came. Now, we're going to learn late in this book that, and this is something he wrote about later. And I have not had the guts to read it because I won't lie. This book near the end can make me cry. I'm glad I'm not reading it to you guys because it is always a struggle for me at the end, not to bust out into tears, not like sobbing, but just be sad because, and it's not so much because Maury dies. It's because of what album says about him at the end that is so moving. Um, but Album and his wife eventually are going to adopt a child that's dying and they're going to take care of her and try to give her a good life while she's still alive. He's written about it. I will not read it because I'm just so terrified it's going to make me cry from page one until the end. Because despite trying to act like I'm a tough guy, this kind of stuff impacts me. All right. Um, I mean, this book particularly is right in line. I told you guys with things that really impact me. You know, I, I feel a lot of kinship with the protagonist. You know, I've tried to throw myself into busyness and to avoid things in my life I didn't want to face. But also the teacher who we find here, because that's what I do for a living. And I'm this I feel a lot of the ways he does. And I want my students to, you know, become eventually friends. Uh, and that's what we're going to see in the next section. So I don't want to get ahead of myself. But this ends with a really cool thing. Now, remember, this is still a book. It still needs narrative elements, even though it's nonfiction. So the last paragraph in the section says it might have stayed that way had I not been flicking through the TV channels late one night when something caught my ear. And then it goes dot, dot, dot. Now, album's going to use that ellipse a lot at the end of sections. It's a brilliant idea. You've seen my emails. I use it all the time. I use it too much. I abuse it. But he uses it very strategically and correctly. And it's meant to make you want to keep turning the page, not want to stop. This book does have the thing that a lot of modern books do where they're very short little sections so that you don't get bogged down. And you do feel a sense of accomplishment, even if you read about five to ten minutes a night. You still feel like you've moved some chapters, and that's that's on purpose. So the thing I wanted to talk to you about, we're going to bring this back towards the end, but just kind of a, a little store this in the back of your head. The idea of we get really wrapped up in accomplishments that we think make us who we are, but the fact is a good big majority of the world does not care a lick about our accomplishments. Um, and that's a sad thing to think, and it, the the – Wrong way to take that is to immediately go to the world and why accomplish anything. Well, because God intended you to be the best person you possibly can be. Um, well, you know, and so if making all A's is the best you can do, then you get out and you do the best you can do because God blessed you with that intellect. And there's a lot of other people who struggle to just pass. So you need to be thankful for what you've got and use it. But the fact is, is that that A, B or that A honor roll certificates you take home after awards day is important to your parents. And that's great. And you want to impress your parents. But I've never gone home and I've been all excited about another kid's accomplishments. So the fact is, is that those are kind of a personal thing. It's, it's, a, it's a checklist to grade yourself against. It should never become our driving force. It never should be the only thing we care about. Um, 
so in, in, and I said I was going to wait till the end, but let's go ahead and do it now. Um, for us here today, um, accomplishments are important. All right, they're they're what help us feel like we've done something and help us feel like there's enough to get up and keep going. But they should never become the goal and the only thing that matters. All right, we see this with professional athletes when all that matters is that paycheck. That's your accomplishment. It's to say how much I made. I'm the highest paid quarterback in the whole in all of the NFL. So now I'm the most important person uh, and we've seen this happen time after time that those teams that have the highest paid quarterbacks don't usually go to the Super Bowl because all the money's tied up in that one person you got your accomplishment great but now the team as a whole is not going to be great all right great example of this is a few years ago Matthew Stafford got was the highest paid quarterback in the league some of you are wondering who that even is and that's that's a good point um he played for the detroit lions who i don't know if they even made the playoffs in the time period he was there if they did they didn't get out of the first round all right because all the money was tied up in him he had achieved his accomplishment but the rest of the team you know they, they didn't get the big accomplishment which would have been big for the team for the ownership for the fans they, they didn't get that he got his own individual personal accomplishment so let me put this in a little bit more of a personal context for you guys a lot of you are driven even though you may not want to pretend like it you're driven and you want those a's in a classroom which is great i'm proud of you for that but when that becomes the only goal is getting that a and learning the material is lost then we we've crossed over into that same section as what matt stafford was in you've achieved this individual selfish goal of you have gotten a, an a on the in this class congratulations you don't know anything so after the moment of you receiving that a and your parents patting you on the back for it what what's left nothing that accomplishment has no no value accomplishments are meant to be shared with others all right they need so you need to seek accomplishments that you can share with others so for you the accomplishment should be to learn this information to learn how to think for yourself for example from fahrenheit 451 or learn how to be grateful to other people and learn how to be uh to reach out to those who have impacted us and realize your life's not just about you because down the road that's going to pay off that a you got is going to pay off in the immediate short term Long term, though, you need to think about how is, uh, you know, what goals do I have that are going to impact my family in the future? So that means building a better person, not just making A's, but building a better person uh, that you can be so that you can be better for your you know, spouse and your children one day or for you can be better for your parents uh, when they need you, that sort of thing. So album learns throughout this book that accomplishments have very little real weight. I mean, yeah, you got a great uh, a. Um, a, a plaque or a statue or something and that's awesome and you can hang it on your wall and no one's going to pay attention or care um, and that doesn't mean it doesn't have value but we want to look at what can have eternal value and, you know not just long-term value but eternal value you know how is this building me as a person that god will be proud of that sort of thing all right okay let's keep going the next section is the one the, the one called the audiovisual i believe there's three of these throughout the book and they all revolve around Maury being on TV because what happens is Maury starts writing down all of these little quips, all these little, he calls them aphorisms. The aphorism is just a short truth that explains life to somebody. So he's writing all these down and he's saving them. And one of his colleagues notices he's doing this and he collects them and he sends them into the Boston Globe, which was a newspaper. I think it's the Boston Globe. I'm almost positive. Yeah, Boston Globe. Uh, and a, one of the reporters writes a story, and the story's headline was A Professor's Final Course, colon, His Own Death. You know, that's great to catch people's eyes, and it doesn't just catch the reader's eyes. It catches national news eyes, and it goes through Nightline with Ted Koppel. Again, someone that people my age know quite well. I'm not sure if any of you know who he is, but he was, you know, Things like Nightline were a different kind of news than what we have now. We have these 24-hour news networks now that are nothing more than advertisements for their own political views. Um, they're really not great sources of news. They um, they tell you what's happening, but then they put such a weird spin on it. You can convince yourself of the most nonsensical things, uh, no matter which end of the political spectrum you find yourself on. Uh, so those don't really count. But things like Nightline in, in this, this time period, you have these news people like Tom Brokaw and Ted Koppel and these other guys who, you know, you trust it. Uh, whether you were a Democrat or Republican, uh, you trusted these guys. And so Ted Koppel is one of these. And he picks up the story and decides he wants to go and interview Maury. So he goes. It's a really funny scene, a really great characterization scene to learn about Maury because Maury doesn't treat it like he's being interviewed. He honestly flips it around like he's interviewing Ted Koppel. Again, Ted Koppel would have been a person who was, you know, 
I know this is a bad example, but it's like a rock, he's a rock star of the news world at this point. You know, you would you everyone would be like, wow, you know, it's so impressive. I'm getting to have, be interviewed by this guy. And Maury doesn't even feel that way. In fact, Maury points out to him, I've seen your show twice. I barely know anything about it, which I mean, that's a humbling experience. And even at one point calls him um, not Ted. What does he call him? He calls him Fred. Yeah, he calls him Fred instead of Ted. You know, it's all these things that little things that indicate Maury's not like starstruck by this guy by even a little stretch in fact he asked him he asked him two things he asked him tell me something or he, he says tell me something close to your heart uh, which is such a weird question if i was to ask each of you and i've done this before in my classes when i ask kids before we read the section tell me something close to your heart most of you will stare awkwardly at your feet and will try to avoid uh having conversation with me at all and that's not really what you want to do all right so um ted tells him that his family, his children particularly, which, you know, hey, that's an easy cop-out for us old folks, uh, you know, for you guys who would have a lot harder. And then he asked him to tell him something about his faith. And again, this is on a national news thing where that's, it's not that you don't talk about it. You know, this idea that there's this hostility to, towards Christianity where you can't even mention it on the news is complete, completely wrong, guys. But uh, it's definitely uncomfortable. So um, the, uh, I apologize for Maddox walking around in the background. Apparently he doesn't understand that I'm filming and he needs to sit down and not be moving. So, uh, maybe me saying that will convince him to sit his butt down and quit walking around. Um, anyway, um, he asked him to tell him something about his faith and, uh, couples really uncomfortable with that. Cause again, he just doesn't want to offend anybody, but uh, his point he says is, um, he quoted a passage from Marcus Aurelius, something he felt strongly about. Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic. We talked about Stoics when we read Julius Caesar. So, uh, but he kind of flips this interview around on his on his head. And uh, we're going to see later, as Maury progressively gets worse, Ted Koppel's going to come back a second time, and then right before he dies, he's going to come back a third time. And the two actually become really good friends. Uh, and that's kind of an important deal, all right? Um, as this end... As this section, the audiovisual closes and we get to the last section that you read for today, um, we get this really kind of, it, it links up the last chapter to this one. So let me read this. It says, the program aired on a Friday night. It began with Ted Koppel from behind his desk in Washington, his voice booming with authority. Who is Maury Schwartz, he said, and why by the end of the night are so many of you going to care about him? A thousand miles away in my house on the hill, I saw I was casually flipping through channels. I heard these words from the TV set, who is Maury Schwartz, and I went numb. So that's what he was talking about at the end of the last chapter that he heard, that, that, that watching TV made him change his mind or made, made him uh, rethink about this professor who he's forgotten about. He's gotten so wrapped up in his own business, he's forgotten all about this guy. Now, the book I have has a little italicized portion here. Yours may seem like it bleeds right into the last chapter, but this was just about uh, Maury and Mitch having a meeting and it closes with kind of an important sentence where Maury says, I hope that one day you will think of me as your friend. I think this is the first time they meet when he's kind of being his advisor and he tells him he wants to think of him as his friend. Now, this is a battle I've had as a teacher forever. All right. You constantly hear that you're not supposed to be friends with students and they don't mean just in the creepy way, like we're hanging out. They mean you shouldn't be friendly with students. This is such a common like advice you get from older teachers or you know depending on the classes you're in you'll get this lecture from one of your professors and it's bunk guys it really is um the fact is is that i am friends with many of my students it doesn't stop me from getting on to you when i need to it doesn't stop me from giving you a bad grade if you earn it but you know i pride myself in the fact that i still have some really strong relationships with kids that have graduated some of my closest friends are kids i've taught they're not kids now. I've been teaching for 15 years. Most of them are, are adults with their own families. But I have maintained that friendship. And because I feel the same way he does, I want I don't want to just be seen as the guy that gives you work and it irritates you. I want to be seen as a friend and someone that can reach out and that you can, you know, an older person that you can speak to when you need help. Um, so it's important that he wants them to be friends. All right. It's a very short section. There's a lot of little breadcrumbs left in this book that lead you to later things that are much more important. OK, so the last section you read was something called the orientation. And this one is about Mitch finally coming to visit his professor once he learns that he's dying. All right. And it's really a telling thing. And it's easy to kind of just read this and not kind of catch on to what the writer's doing here. But um, there's a lot of going, a lot of characterizing our narrator here. Because you have to characterize them too. Novice writers who are writing when they meet, it's through first person, screw this up constantly. But it's like you need to. You not just characterize the other people. You need to make sure you're characterized and you need to be honest about your characterization. You can't make yourself look perfect. And 
you know, Mitch Albert's doing a great job of not making himself look perfect here. He's got this indicator of him like driving to see Maury and talking on the phone the entire time, still working. You know, hasn't unplugged from that. He's throwing himself into business, just like we saw in the first chapter we read today. He's in, just filled with that. That's all he cares about, all right? He gets to Maury's house quicker than he ex planned to, and he hides down. He ducks his head down where they can't see him so he can finish his phone call, which is a business phone call. It is one of the most aggravating parts of this book that he does this. Um let me read this. He says, for all the time we'd spent together, for all the kindness and patience Maury had shown me when I was young, I should have dropped the phone and jumped from the car and run and held him and kissed him hello. Instead, I killed the engine and sunk down off the seat as if I were looking for something. Yeah, yeah, I'm here, I whispered and continued my conversation with the TV producer until we were finished. I did what I had become best at doing. I tended to my work, even while my dying professor waited on his front lawn. I am not proud of this, but that is what I did. To get this image of him making Maury wait on him while he handles work stuff that could honestly wait. But again, how often we do this? We throw ourselves into busyness. You know, this time period right now when there's all this chaos in the world, that is what so many adults are doing. They can do it. That's why so many of us are stressed out at home because you can't throw yourself into busyness. What do you do? You know, I mean, it, you can only do so much watching TV and before you realize you're not busy. So you find other things to throw yourself into. And, uh, you know, a lot of that's been taken from us. You know, some people would use the gym. They would go and work out and you can't do that. Some people, it would be, you know, their actual jobs. There's only so much you can do from home. There's only so many videos I can make. There's only so many, I mean, I can only grade what you guys turn in. <laughs> so all of this, you know, this throwing yourself in business this is a common way to avoid dealing with, you know, difficult feelings and emotions. Um, so... He brings back the details about graduation day that we saw yesterday's reading. Uh, that's kind of cool. This is another great writer's technique. You know, if you the initial early details you plant, go ahead and bring them back up throughout the story to kind of show this unifying through the book, which is what he's doing. All right. Um, so we get to the last little part of this. He says, Mitch, he said softly, you know that I'm dying. I knew. All right, then. Maury followed the pills, put down the paper cup, inhaled deeply and let it out. Shall I tell you what it's like? What it's like to die? Yes, he said, although I was unaware of it, our last class had just begun. Again, notice that ending. Um, every chapter that Mitch Alvin does has that little last sentence that really grabs your attention, makes you want to keep reading. Because honestly, you can read this book in one day. It's not a long book. It's not a hard book. And I think he's designed us to want to keep reading. All right. There's another italicized passage after this. Um, it's, again, one of those moments about early Mitch and Maury moments about how, uh, you know, Maury's trying to break Mitch of his tough guy persona, which is going to be carried out throughout this book. <clears throat> and by tough guy, he doesn't mean fighting in the streets. Um, although I think Mitch was kind of that kind of a person, but he means more of the allowing yourself to feel things. Um, you know, my generation and before for guys, it's always been a, you don't show emotion. Um, that's, that's not a manly thing to do. And we've constantly been taught to bear things in silence and not let people know when we're upset. Uh, anger is okay, but sadness isn't. You don't let people know when you're sad. Um, it's why, like I said, I'm scared to let people see me read this book in class because I get upset and cry about it. Because no matter how much I know that's stupid, it's still ingrained in who I am. So Maury's not that way, though. And Maury's trying his best to let Mitch, get Mitch to let his guard down throughout this book, particularly about his, his brother. We're going to learn more about his brother. It may be in tomorrow's reading. If not, it'll be in this week sometime. We're going to learn Mitch has a brother, and they have a really strained relationship. So as we close out, because it's got a little long, but I kind of just let myself go today. Um, and, you know, I hope a couple of you watched the whole thing. If some of you got bored and turned it off, well, what am I going to do? Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, but I really want you to think today about how many accomplishments you put a lot of pride in. And then I want you to think about what are the things you should be putting pride in? There's nothing wrong with being proud of your accomplishments. If you've got perfect attendance or you've got all A's, that's terrific. Um, but you also need to look, sorry, there's an alarm going off. Hey, can you go get that? Is that that phone? So just bring it over here. Sorry, I apologize. I don't want to refilm 25 minutes. So I'm going to cut off here, guys. Be thinking about your accomplishments. Think about things that you can put pride in that you really want to do and that you want to uh, build on. They're going to be long-term goals, okay? Enjoy the short term, but look towards the long term. Don't forget about it, all right? So sit down right now. Take some time. Give me three long-term goals that you really are thinking of. If you want to share them with me, I'd love to hear them. But three long-term goals that you want over the rest of this. You have 
two years of high school left because this this year you know is is basically done. Two more years of high school. What are we going to do long? What what things are we going to invest in those two years that long term down the road are going to be better for you? All right. So love you guys. Y'all have a great Tuesday, uh, and I will talk to you again Wednesday morning.